seeing is believing and I have no proof of what I saw that day other than what I can describe. It was huge. It was like the weightlifter of cats. I think he's seen a black leopard, no doubt about it. He's just a guy taking his dogs for a walk who's bumped into something that he can't explain and wants to tell people without being mocked about it. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hi everyone, and welcome to Big Cat Conversations. For this episode, we're going to be talking about some events in South Devon in the last few years, and our guest is Matt, who's based there. And welcome, Matt. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, hi, Rick. Thanks for having me. I look forward to having a chat. Great, thank you. And we're going to be talking to Matt about his experience in using trail cameras and looking for signs of the cats in the countryside of South Devon. We're going to be focusing on the best photos he's taken. Some of them are sort of 50-50s and generate discussion even arguments sometimes amongst people that we network (laughs) with. But we're going to be talking about the best ones. But before we get to those and how Matt goes about sussing out his local landscape, Matt, could you tell us about what first triggered your interest in the subject? Was it when you were working at a wildlife park establishment and you reckoned it was getting a bit leaky? There was two events that triggered it, really. That was the main one where I'd, I'd worked at the establishment and I was told quite clearly that in previous years, previous owners had released pumas in the local area. I think it was three, including, you know, males and females. So obviously we all know what can happen there. Also, at the same sort of time, I think it was only a few weeks after that, I was out, you know, in the wildlife with the family and my ex-wife said, stop, stop, stop. There's a lynx. OK. We braked heavily and sort of reversed and that is country lane. And I could see the movement in the bushes where clearly some sort of animal was sort of running away. And she said it looked like it was sitting up on a bank looking down the road with its, you know, the pointed ears. So within a few weeks, quite some time ago, there was a lot of interest. And it was like, OK, well, perhaps these wildcats do exist. And that sort of sparked my interest, really. Yeah, now it's a very much a key interest, isn't it? Yeah, I enjoy going out on the walks and I do study my sort of areas and I do talk to people and everyone seems down this part of the world seems to have a story or know someone that has got one, especially going back to the days when people used to own them. I think you could buy them in Harrods, couldn't you, until the early 80s. So people obviously had them and I get lots of information from talking to people, including people that work out on different moors down this way and uh, farmers, plumbers, you know, people that have been driving around. I had a, about a year ago, a friend of my son's dad is a DJ and was coming home at two o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't prompted. This was a story that was told to my son. I wasn't asking about, have you ever seen a big cat? Um, driving home at two o'clock in the morning, you know, huge sandy coloured puma just trotted across the road in front of his car. There was no prompting. There was no, have you ever seen a big cat? It was a story that it was told. I mean, yeah. And this often happens down here. I mean, I could tell quite a lot of stories that people have told me and people that haven't got anything to gain by lying. There was another old lady, I think in her 80s, that had lived in a, a house with a field to the, the rear. Her cat was up on the windowsill, looked very scared up on the windowsill. The horses in the field had all gone to one corner. And she thought, why is my cat acting like that? Looked out the window. During the day, it was a daylight sighting, and it was just trotting past the back of a house in the field was what she describes as a black leopard. Yeah, and I think it's always helpful when somebody's got a sighting, but there's a cat or a dog or a horse to sort of back it up. Absolutely. I've worked in a, an equestrian-type place in Cornwall, and the lady was there was telling me various stories, and this was probably five, six years ago now. And she said that um, a friend of hers was run out on one of the horses and was trotting up a path. Um, and the horse started pulling back and pulling back for no reason. Uh, and she looked down to her left and she described as what was cubs, black cubs in the long grass down to the left of the pathway. But mum mustn't have been far away because the horse was, you know, really pulling up and acting strange. And it was getting out of their quick time. Um, and off they went, of course. No, if that had been me, I'd have took pictures. But of course, we we're kind of half trained to do it, aren't we? Other people, blimey, I better get out of here. And again, what have these people got to gain by making the story up? just chatting away, working there, and that was the story. There's an awful lot of these stories. It's the detail as well. It's detail that you'd be hard to invent, wouldn't it, some of that? I seem to get quite a bit of luck with the trail cams because just talking to people, and they'll say, oh, we often see them up there, or um, they're known to be there. So then I use Google Earth to look at the area and then sort of think, okay, well, there's the water supply, there's the wooded area, 
they've got to get from there to there. There's, there's plenty of food there, plenty of food sources. So I think there would be a good place to put a trail cam. And then lo and behold, you put it out and you get lucky. Yes, I think it's right. You you need local people who you trust, who you think are going to mm-hmm. be credible people to point you in the right direction. I think you can't just start any old where and hope for the best unless you're very lucky or very brilliant. Yeah, you're looking at an area of, say, moorland, for example, the size of, say, London, and you're putting a trail cam out and you're asking a creature that a lot of people think don't exist in this country to walk past that camera. <laughs> it's very difficult to do. If you do your work and, you, you know, you give yourself as much chance as possible, camouflage the cameras, angle of the camera. I often look for things like choke points within those areas because if the animals are moving to a certain area, then that's a good place to have your camera. But if you're pointing it direct at the choke point from further away than the beam, so I tend to work at angles or wait for something to come through the choke point and I put it on the wall behind so it comes through and then it doesn't even know it's had its picture taken because the trail cam's behind it. And sometimes I, I make my own choke points. I'll use trees that are down or bushes to funnel animals into a certain direction into where the camera is. And I've, I've been lucky doing that too. Yeah, very good. I, I agree. You've got to make your own luck and you're not going to do that sitting at home. No. Nope. The point about whether they can detect the cameras, I think um, you probably noticed, like a lot of us, that you get more wildlife activity on the cameras, mostly when they've weathered in a bit. Yes. They clearly smell them, I think, early on before they've weathered in. They clearly get freaked by... Uh, something new in their territory and Mm -hmm. the main thing that alerts them i think is the click most of them have a a little click when they um trigger i think it's that that makes them look up in a startled way i often will put two or three cameras in the same place it's so frustrating when you walk four miles to deploy a camera and when you go back it hasn't triggered but the food's gone or the bait's gone type thing you know it's very frustrating but when you put a camera facing another camera and the camera does get triggered, the camera that's triggering sees the other camera. You can see the beam, you can see the lens. So camera can see camera beams. Doing that is worth it because you've got extra illumination and the illumination is crucial. And you're more, although um, you're going to be talking in a minute about getting success in daylight, it's more likely that we're going to get these animals at night or dawn and dusk when there's lower light. So the beam of the cameras and the quality of that illumination is really important. And um, episode um, 17 with Neil, who farms near the edge of Bodmin, um, you helped him put the cameras out. So tell us a bit about what happened there. Great guy, Neil. A lovely piece of land. And I went over there with my son and I met his son and spent quite a few hours there. It's a very interesting piece of land right on the edge of Bodmin Moor. There's obviously been lots of history there. And, you know, sightings on his land from previous owners and local people that have got stories, etc., what prompted us going was he'd had some kills, didn't he, on his land, which was quite interesting to sort of see where they'd happened. And obviously, once you're on scene, you can basically work out the route that the animal's taken. Mm-hmm. I can't remember how many we deployed in him, but six, seven, something like that. Yes, that is such a fantastic piece of land in such a hot spot with kills that you could put 400 cameras on there. It's that intense around there with previous sightings. So, I mean, that is exactly the sort of place where if you focus all your work and all your cameras and everything on, you would probably get lucky. Yes. How did you prioritise those six cameras in a place where you had plenty of choice? I kind of looked at the route that the animal that had created the kills had taken, which obviously we got the evidence of where the kill was. And you can see entry points to fields are limited with high fences or a clear opening that it's gone for. And then you can sort of work your way backwards from there. And I just kind of combined that with the other kill and thought, well, okay, it's obviously coming from this direction. Neil had kindly sent me some sort of Google images and marked where the kills had been prior to me getting there. So I understood the lay of the land before I got there. Done my homework and the route that he worked us back into his land was, you know, there's a low wall. If you're coming through here, you a cat would stay out of way. And this is probably where the route they would take to the auto or whatever it might be. And you just kind of use instinct, really, just to kind of think your way around and put cameras in interesting places. And you can't just always leave a camera in the same spot. I think moving them has helped me in the past. Once they detect it might be there, they'll take a different route. And those pictures that you're going to talk to me about in a minute, the daylight sightings were because I got the first shot and then I moved it in the same wood and it had come a different way, I think, personally, to avoid the noise or the it would know as an unusual subject in its wood, uh, being the camera, and he walked straight into the trap. Brilliant. Well done, yeah. But then other people 
will swear blind if you leave it there for two or three years the you know animals will get used to it being there and will just happily walk past it i'm in that camp <laughs> and i understand that too you know i'm not you must move your cameras to trick it i mean it's just something i decided to do i just got lucky yeah yeah sure thanks about neil's land and i'm looking forward to going there and probably you know add add one or two the more cameras the better there that is a really interesting piece of land definitely as you know, Matt, it's so important to have good links with landowners who've got land. Absolutely. Yeah. And who are interested in the subject too, because a lot of a lot of people might have a different interest in cats being on their land. <laughs> they don't want the attention, for example, or you know, the focus on their land. It's an interesting subject. It's good to have them being interested in it and having the land. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Can we talk about you sussing out your more local area that you go to regularly? A field sign that you found was an eaten out pony. Can you tell us about it? Again, it was a family trip out. It was to the side of the road. My instant reaction was, is this a roadkill? And then birds or whatever have been at it. But you could clearly see it being dragged down the hill to the left of the road. There was drag marks. So it had been dragged down away. And the throat was completely ripped out. Very clean cuts around the area. It had been completely cleaned out. One of its legs had been completely bitten through the leg. So whatever has done that is, is powerful enough to bite through the bone of a leg. I'm more experienced now that you know I could have possibly taken that and you could have had that forensically tested and swabbed and everything. But at the time, when you're there with kids, it's like, that's not very nice, is it? And off we go. So it was get out as quickly as we can and carry on with our day. But An older foal? Yes, it was a foal, yes, definitely. It was fresh. You could tell it was fresh. It wasn't mess everywhere. Like you know, Perhaps the dog had done it. But uh, in my opinion, it was a cat. And again, it's only my opinion. That sort of, again, would highlight an area to me. And that actually is probably only half a mile from those daylight sightings in the same wood. Okay. That's very, very close by, which, of course, has got me to that area. Let's get on to those daylight photos that are on the website. And the first one that you got was, I think, if it had been forward-facing, it would have been a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10, which is, of course, you know what we crave for. But it's going from behind, and so it sort of reduces it to a sort of 5 out of 10. But I think the tail is very compelling. So can you tell us about getting that one? Yep, yeah, um, I got lucky on that one because I got information from someone that worked in the area. And the information I was given was there are large wild cats at this particular area. And I said, what do you mean by wild cats? He said, well, they're not pumas or leopards or anything, as he was gulping. Um, <laughs> um, 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 they're just big cats that are wild. And then he scurried off. So I thought, well, that's all the information I needed. Again, I just did my bit of research on the area. And there was the woods. There was the water source. And there was a choke point. And I thought, right, so somewhere in there then. And then I think I was told on the Sunday, I deployed the cameras, I think, on the Tuesday. And by Thursday, I had the footage. It was quite a quick turnaround. And again, it's only luck. You know, yes, you might have done my little bit of research and talking to the individual helped massively. But it's luck. I could have put it. 20 yards to the right and not got it yeah what was interesting with that shot there is that the previous night campers had come and decided to pitch up right in front of the camera Mm -hmm. and they'd seen the camera they were looking at it they were kneeling down looking at it and rather than steal the camera they decided to put their football in front of it for the evening the next day what i believe is a large cat comes walking through where the campers were now was were they cooking a barbecue yeah and I think it was about an hour to an hour and a half after the campers left that the cat came through. So it could quite possibly have been watching them and waiting for them to leave, give it a little while, and then I'll go over to see what's been left for me, like a free meal or whatever it might be. Yeah. I got the picture that way, and it had come from behind. It came down a game trail that was leading there, which is why I'd put it there. It walked right down the game trail and passed the camera. Now, it wasn't an expensive camera, so it didn't have the world's quickest reactive time trigger speed. That's probably what, again, cost us a little bit because had it been £140 worth of camera, it would have took the pictures much quicker and I'd have got a burst of free and a video as opposed to it's triggered it a reasonable distance away um, and then it disappeared. It's a great picture in my opinion. Things like this give you heart, don't they? I think the key thing on this one is you can work out that it has got a very thick, long, extended tail with the sunlight on the sort of base of it and there's no real other animal. It does look leopard-like, really, and it's sort of uh, textured. It's got rosettes. I mean, you can see the rosettes. I'm not sure how many dogs that are two and a half foot tall with a tail that looks like that um, have got rosettes. Also, that one is reasonably close. I think one of the problems with trail camera photos is that they're often too far away to be clear enough 
to be compelling. That one, if it was forward facing, that would have been the one we're after, really, wouldn't it? I think. Um, absolutely. And that direction where it was walking, probably 20 yards in front of that, maybe 30, I then put the camera facing the other way. And 18 days later, we got it coming back the other way. The one that's the side shot with the builder's level. Spirit level, yeah. Yeah, spirit level. What's really interesting about the second one from the side view with the spirit level is something else triggered the camera because it's too far away to get it. And the first two shots in that burst of three shows a thick black tail to the left. And what we described at the time as Batman is shadowing onto a tree. So whatever that was triggered the camera because it had come from behind my camera. And we were just fortunate enough that to the right, the large, well, I think it's, it's about seven foot long, mm. and we'll call it an animal, come charging through the woods from the right-hand side. And, you know, it's very, very feline looking, as you can see from the website. But yeah. So again, there was a possibility there. There was two together. Yes. You can see a shadow by a tree, and it does look cat-like sitting up by the tree from the shadow. Then it moves away, and then it's done a loop and comes back on itself. So that's the other scenario. But I quite agree, it could equally be another one coming at the side. I've been to, obviously, that location, you know, 300 times, but it's physically impossible to forget for where that head was in a change of direction, coming back again in, in the trigger time. It's impossible, even for a, an animal at the speed of a cat. It's like 25, 30 yards. It's not two yards. I've often thought about the possibility that the first one to the left might have been a dog and the cat has come in to attack the dog. Yeah. I thought about, you know, it might have been a deer and it come in, you know, or something like that, but we won't know. Yeah, picture three is, again, compelling because you've got head, ears, body and thick long tail and we've got a scale on it which shows that it's, I think it must be a big tom to be at that scale and the, t- yeah. the scaling, if the spirit level isn't precisely where the animal stroke cat was, mm-hmm. it's within a foot of it, isn't it? Oh, it's real close. The tree it goes past had a distinctive arm branched off, if that makes sense. Okay. And it was clearly, this is the tree, this is where it was. And at the base of that tree was like um, a branch coming low level, like a log almost, where you had to jump over. Mm. So it appears it was springing over that as it was just sort of trotting through. The actual recreation is very close to where it was, very, very close. Of course, that's the discipline that one needs on all of these photos, whatever their quality is. You do need to reshoot the photo from the same starting point at the same target position yes. to suit and then superimpose the reference pictures and get your scale and a great guy called dave helps us yeah we'll hopefully have him on the show one day to talk about some of that work he's done he can do sort of the overlapping and things like that which is fantastic work that dave does but it's thick tail and the size of it yeah again it limits it to what it can actually be and what makes that photo quite interesting is it's only 12 paces away from where 18 days earlier we had the rear view of the one we were just discussing yeah so not only does it look like a cat we think it's a cat mm. it's 12 paces away in the same wood as something else we thought was a cat 18 days earlier so i think if you know lots of little maybes you know and up to her probably had we had something of better quality that burst of three photos photo three and that burst of three would have been you know the 10 out of 10 especially to have it leaping you know really is an action photo isn't it yeah it's- absolutely absolutely and what i like about it as well it's the fact that it's burst three of three it's not well, i've got one photograph and you know it could have been someone laying on the ground and lifts up a, a cuddly toy you know it's not it's clearly a series of three photographs and uh, burst from a trail camera yeah, because th- there's always the tactical judgment about whether you set your trail cameras to video or photo burst. I am a photo burst guy because if I'm leaving my cameras out for a long while, if a squirrel or crows or something set the videos off, it's going to run through the batteries very quickly. So I'd rather have the camera working. Well, I've fallen for that trick myself. One of the tricks I use is to put the Hessian sack and you can put go to like your local butchers and get the chop off bits of meat and you put them in the Hessian sack and hang it from a tree. I'd put a few on the floor lining up to it. And what had happened is I'd set my camera up. I thought, well, this is going to get it. It was a prime location. I set it on video. I thought, right, I'm going to get the crystal clear video. This is the one, you know, (laughs) but I think that every time. But anyway, so what happened is birds are coming and eating the ones that I sort of laid a trail up to it. We're pecking away at the Hessian sack and the battery went dead after about 50 minutes. And then I went back the next night. The Hessian sack's been ripped down. Clearly a large animal's been there. 
it had huge claw marks down the Hessian sack and all the meat had gone. Frustrating. And it was like, uh, if, if I'd have just had that on photo, not video, it would have lasted for like four months. So you do learn, but if someone wants the video, you know, you have to put it on video, which goes back to what we said earlier, possibly have two or three cameras on a scene with different settings. Yeah, different types of cameras, different makes of cameras have got different pros and cons. There's no best one. I've done that before as well. Another one I've done is put a camera, um, I've put a camera on a choke point and uh, the one that's looking at the choke point from the sort of side angle which would have got you that 10 out of 10 shot, fails to work, but you get a tail or something like that for the other camera and it's just not good enough or, or a whisker or an ear sticking up or something. Yeah, yeah. Whereas and if you had the cameras the other way around, you'd have got the 10 out of 10 shot. I mean, it's so frustrating, but, you know, it's all part of it. You know, yeah. you put a smile on your face and he's, you got beaten again and you go out and try some more, you know. And meanwhile, the scoffers and the sceptics are laughing, thinking, oh, these deluded big cat people. But of course, it gives heart, doesn't it? I think that's the way to think about it. If people want to scoff, people want to scoff. The thing is, with this, Rick, if you, if you sit indoors at night when it's dark and you hardly go out anywhere and you just go to work and back uh, and you go to the gym and Tesco's and you start again tomorrow, the chances are you'll never see a big cat. Mm. And you never get any evidence of one, and you can scoff all you like. Yes. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. That's their opinion. People are entitled to their opinion. If you go out and put cameras in woods and you do your homework and you do a bit of studying and you talk to people, you have a better chance. So maybe these scoffers would like to actually go out and do that and maybe they'll come across some evidence of their own. But Yeah, it's easy to nitpick, isn't it? It's easy to pick holes. I do it for a bit of fun, to be quite honest with you. I don't have to fake pictures in the woods of, of big cats. I've, I've got better things to do with my time. I quite enjoy the walk. I quite enjoy the challenge of trying to you know, outwit a leopard, if you like and just get a shot. Um, I've got two that are really good. So you can get good shots if you put the effort in, I think is the way of describing it. And if people want to scoff at it, then let them scoff at it. And the daytime ones, I think, are so helpful, especially the burst of three, photo three, and that wouldn't really have worked at night. I don't think we would have seen it. It would be too far away, just outside the illumination range. There was some reason why a cat was there for quite a while and was active in daylight. So you reckon it was maybe there was a layup spot nearby? I think so. You know, I had a good look around. There was some big trees that were down in the area, and then the bottom of the tree had sort of over, overgrown the hole it came out of, and it almost looked like a den, you know. There are some old sort of ruins and stuff around there, and I actually had a third camera in those woods that day, mm. which would have been probably 10 yards from where that picture three, that animal came from. That failed to work. Yeah, yeah. Would you rather have one or two high-end, high-quality cameras, trail cameras, or more lower-quality ones which are less reliable? But All of the above. <laughs> OK, now you've got the choice. You've got limited budget. Is it a numbers game or would you have quality? If I had to make a choice, it would be quality because you'd get faster trigger speeds, more reliability and more clarity with the shot. It would be more obvious what it was. Quarries are good places. Disused quarries, I feel, are very good places. Lots of sightings in those areas. There was a ridge that hardly any humans went. I deployed a camera up there, basically because I'd found a half-eaten-out sheep, which was just laying there. I deployed the cameras on it, which were cheap cameras. We had birds come in. We had a fox come in and sniffed at it. And then it went dead. Nothing happened. And then it started working again. And the carcass had been moved about 10 foot. Mm. Something strong enough to move it had come in dragged it away without triggering the camera now had that been 200 pounds worth of top camera i don't think that would happen i know lots of the guys that do this and enjoy this subject have got similar stories of things moving and, and cameras not triggering i think given the choice i would probably go with quality but quantity is equally as important because the, obviously the more cameras you've got the more chance it's the law of averages so, but of course, if the camera doesn't work, it's a waste of time, haven't it? Yeah, but I'd also worry that we might be less inclined to put those expensive cameras out in some locations because the cheaper cameras make you take the risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I think possibly the way forward there is to have four or five expensive cameras that get deployed to an area when someone says there's lots of activity in this area. Yeah. Like, for example, when I had the two in the same wood in 18 days. Mm. And when something like that occurs, deploy the expensive ones for a short period of time. Yes. And go, right, we'll give it one month of expensive cameras. And if it works great, we'll bring down the risk by taking them out of the wood and seeing what we got. Selective use when you think you're homing in. Yes, a little bit like Neil's land, where there was two kills. 
location tells you everything history of um, sightings right one month everything we've got get it down there and see what we can get In terms of giving advice to people who are starting out and want to look for evidence, and what sort of things do you feel is the best way ahead for getting some influential evidence? What would you do if you were starting afresh? The first thing I'd do is is study where you're going to do it, because if you live in central London, you've probably got no chance. So you have to sort of have a target area. Once you've got a target area, is speak to people in the area. Just generally, uh, farmers or you know, policemen. Um, lots of policemen have got stories. I know policemen have got great stories. You mm-hmm. know? Find out as much as you can. So build up a knowledge base of where you're going to do it, and then do some homework. Something that stood me in a very well is working an area or a woodland consistently. Mm-hmm. So you know that area, you know the entry points, exit points, etc. Mm-hmm. So once you've got a target area, stick to it. If you put cameras in some wooded area by a stream for two weeks and then you move it somewhere else for two weeks and then etc etc chances are you're limiting your chances i think you need to focus on an area with some knowledge and some history i'm fortunate because i live in an area that's got a rich history of it yeah everyone's got a story for me it's it's quite simple to actually go out and say right well i focus on the next four months i'm going to work in these two woods next to each other i put out some tripe or i put out some bait in a hessian sack wherever it might be Mm. and off you go Camouflage, I think camouflage in your camera so they don't get stolen. If you can wedge them between rocks and camouflage them and put sort of moss around them, the edges and pack it in and you're never going to see them. Spend the time camouflaging the camera, get it in the correct area and change the batteries regularly, obviously. Test them before you put them out. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people get a new camera off eBay, put it out in the woods and it doesn't trigger. So put it in your garden, test it with your dog coming in and out, whatever. And then when it's used to working and you know what to expect, then put it out in the field. So these are little things, you know. That's helpful. Thank you. What about the view that there's more to this than just using trail cameras? It depends what kind of evidence people are after, because even if you get the most crystal clear HD video, someone will start saying, well, it's from a private collection or it's from the so released from the circus or it's from, you know, there'll always be someone that comes back with and says that's not real. Unless it's mother and cubs. Yeah, then that will be interesting. I think video footage is best because it's moving. Have your phone in an area like your right hand pocket if you're right handed where you can quickly go to your phone if you're in those woods where you think cats are operating. Get ready to get your footage. I mean, I saw the footage, was it Forrest of Dean, where the guy was watching deer? Yeah. He got off his bike, and, and there it was. A lot of people might go, what's that, and get on their bike and shoot off. If you flick your camera out real quick, I mean, seconds, probably two seconds, you can have your phone on record. Yeah, that's a great bit of footage. It's only a glimpse and it's only very briefly, but I think it's the real thing and he did really well to do that. Absolutely. He spoke to Frank Tunbridge, who we mention a lot on these episodes, who's a good mate of ours in Gloucester, and Mm -hmm. Frank has lost his phone number, so we can't contact him to invite him on the show, but that would be wonderful to hear about on the show. So we're trying to find his phone number, see if he will come on, because we'd love to hear about that. And we have linked that on the website. That was clear. To me, that was clear. It's almost like training yourself to do things in a certain way once you're in those woods. So you've got your backpack, you might have some water and some cameras in it or whatever you might have. But have your phone ready, have it there. GoPros, I don't personally use one. Or cheaper equivalents because they're quite pricey, but cheaper equivalents of GoPros. Little box things which you can put in plastic boxes which canoeists use and cyclists use and you can mount them on you. Exactly right. So if you're out doing this, then why not have one of them strapped to your cap or tied to your top pocket or whatever it might be so if something happens you've got the evidence because with things like dash cams nowadays look how much technology has come on it's only a matter of time until someone says have a look at this and it will, it will be a huge cat that leaps out crosses the road in front of the car and it will be the width of their car as high as their bonnet and it will spring into the bushes and there's your evidence technology moving forward but i think train yourself to react in certain ways when you're out in the field and that, that will help There's also surprises because we go on about, oh, there can't be many dogs out in the countryside at night. There can't be many dogs out in the countryside without collars. And in fact, you showed me that you've got black Labrador scavenging on something without a collar at night. Even the camera showing that up, proving that some of our main rules are wrong, obviously rarely wrong, hopefully, but that's helpful, isn't it? Absolutely. That particular incident you're talking about there was was a dead horse out, out on the moor. I think I put two or three cameras on it. One of which was um, a black Labrador coming in, no collar, strong. You can, you can tell it was well fed. This was a, a healthy animal, no collar. Probably, I think it off the top of my head, was one, two o'clock in the morning, something like that. An owner didn't appear. I mean, people might walk their dog up one, two in the morning. I don't know. But 
without a collar five miles from the nearest house <laughs> yeah it's probably less likely but so yeah who knows what else is out there i mean i've heard all sorts of stories i've heard people tell me they've seen wolves you know but i mean have they i don't know yeah i haven't but it, well it might be a wolf dog of course you can get some a wolf dog mm-hmm. which is um you know almost identical to a wolf but i think it's also important to discuss the hybrid cats because it doesn't necessarily mean because a cat is big and powerful and lives out in the wild that it's a leopard or it's a puma or whatever it might be i've got a picture of a black cat point blank range i think you might remember it um mm. staring at the camera um i've also got a fox doing the same thing to the same camera and the cat is twice as big as the fox but has the face of a domestic um and again it's in the middle of nowhere so is that a wild cat is it um it had real thick long rough hair and no collar on and of course the photos of these will not prove what they are so that's why dna yep. is important so different types of evidence are crucial it's not just yep. uh, just video Absolutely. or photos and i agree we shouldn't always assume that it's just the primary three candidates of black leopard puma and lynx we don't know fully till we get more dna evidence as you say you're not looking just for you know, the standard links um, in the same area. A woman told me her daughter was riding a horse and she described it as a lynx because they looked it up afterwards, mm-hmm. trotted across the road in front of the horse and the horse was pulling up. It stopped, it looked at the horse and carried on trotting across the road, but had a huge long tail. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So a lynx, but with a huge long tail. Again, is, is that, you know, some sort of hybrid? I, what was it? So it's a very, very interesting subject. Very interesting. We ought to come to the last bit of the chat and your view on big cats living in the wild in Britain generally. We ask all our guests that. There's no right or wrong. Yeah, I think leave them to it. They're very secretive anyway, aren't they? And they keep down the deer population or whatever it might be now. It's fine. It's fine by me that they're out there. They're not roaming around our streets like foxes. Um, like they, perhaps they do a little bit more in India or places like that. They come into townships and stuff, don't they? Hmm. I think one of the reasons a lot of people like to think that they and like to keep brushed under the carpet is because they don't want the attention, they don't want the culling, they don't want to start having to put signs up in woods, you know, be careful of leopards and, you know, stuff like that. I think they like to keep it quiet, like to keep it brushed under the carpet. I fully believe they're there. Um, and not just, as I said, not just pumas, um, black leopards and lynxes. I think you'll find it's hybrid cats that have evolved over the many, many years, lots of times over, in large, strong wild cats so as you say until you get a dna until you get a body you're not going to know exactly what it is i've no doubt that leopards still breed with leopards and there's multiple of leopards out there but do lynxes breed with pumas or, or whatever it might be there's a multitude of cats out there different colors i mean we've seen gray ones red ones sandy colored black and there's all sorts isn't there you adapt to your environment don't you till we get that hard evidence the dna whatever you want to call it you know, then some of these questions can be answered. No one ever does anything about it, then we'll never find out, will we? Yeah, exactly. And it is scientifically fascinating. Yeah. Someone needs to prove it educational wise, like all the hard work you put in. It's good that it's got people doing that. Yeah. Well, we're all in it together and we all help each other. And it's great that there's, you know, people that have got that curiosity. We haven't got the professional status at a university lab to worry about, if you like. No, <laughs> just get on with it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's only a matter of time. My opinion is that with dash cams, iPhones, GoPros, with people who've got this new technology now, it's only a matter of time till you get that amazing shot. It might be mum crossing the road with, you know, cubs or whatever it might be, and kids, whatever you want to call them, crossing the road somewhere. It's only a matter of time. And we've already got evidence. We've already got trail cam shots. We've got lots of stories. We've got police helicopter videos. I think there's a few circulating around on YouTube. It's only a matter of time. But of course, Matt, we need to prove all three of the main primary candidates you need one of each don't you close up and you need mother and cub really to prove that they're viable breeding yeah absolutely and the only way you'll get that is by being out in the field and putting the effort in i mean there's things like the environmental dna now where you can gather earth from a certain area and you can tell everything that's coming in contact with it if you've got endless supply of money you can prove certain things by doing that you know technology moves forward and i'm very confident that the amount of people the amount of areas that are covered now just listening to these podcasts you know and how many people put the effort in in different parts of the country in hot spots too it's only a matter of time until someone comes up trumps yeah but of course we also know of some photos that never make it to the wider public and i quite understand that so there'll be stuff out there that people have got that they think this is you know, i don't want the consequences of this known about which is quite understandable so some people keep it quiet anyway 
I just do this because it's an interest, a bit of a hobby and a bit of exercise thrown in. Make some friendships along the way and crack on. I don't need to do this to try and prove anything to anyone about this, that and the other, or faking anything. Um, and I don't think most other people that do it do either, to be quite honest with you. But if it's got a wider benefit and it adds to the bigger picture, it's nice to do that, isn't it? Absolutely. The stories that I get from people, people aren't phoning up saying, I've seen a zebra or a giraffe. They're ringing up saying they've seen Big Cat and they're quite passionate you can tell me i had a guy phone me uh, from north devon live from the scene and he was panting away this this has come across the road and he, he was like that he was he was telling me live from the scene i said try and get your get your phone out get down there try and get a picture of it and you know you could tell the passion you could tell that he just seen one and of course had he have had a dash cam we'd have had the 10 out of 10 shot let people judge for themselves. That's the good thing about this. I haven't come on here to say that this is a fact. This is what's happening. This is what we can provide. This is what my experience, I can provide this for you to have a look at. Now, it's up to you. If you think it, that exists, great. If they don't, you don't, then that's fine. <laughs> Let's put the kettle and have a chat about something else. That's fine. It's no big deal, you know. And you know, some people get very het up and stressed about it and they don't exist. And well, maybe they do. It's an interesting subject for people that just want to just be nice, normal people that enjoy the subject. Yeah, and we can make make a contribution how we can. And I think the other thing is we we don't need to be in a desperate rush. You know, things will emerge as technology improves, as more people get interested, as as we get lucky, and and people's views change. As some people may have material that they don't want to release and eventually they may think well hang on you know there's a picture here there's a bigger picture building up it's being treated responsibly some people probably are reticent to reveal what they have because they feel it could all go pear-shaped if they had well if we show that it's going to be treated in a reasonable way and people aren't going to uh, take pitchforks to the hills if we get, if we release the information then that might change attitudes and also people don't have to actually say where it was taken or who they are they could just, you know, they can often just give the footage. Of course, then the problem with that is, is that people say, well, that could have been taken in South Africa or that could have been taken in wherever. And that's that's the problem behind that. But you're right. I think people will get more confident in doing it. And I don't understand why people get ridiculed because they tell people at the police station or the, you know, wherever they work, Tesco's, oh, I saw a big cat last night. Well, why, why, why would you be ridiculed? Why would you not believe the person? You know, what is it about this big cat thing? Well, I don't understand it. All no, there's, there's none of them in this country. Well, you know, maybe there is. It's a culture shock, and it's back to your point earlier on that a lot of people who live standard sort of suburban lives just feel it's too out of uh, out of the ordinary, and they don't realise how stealthy these animals are and how difficult they're to see. So they, they think everybody would be seeing them if, if they were real. Well, absolutely. The fact that many people did own them in this country and they were released. I mean, we've all seen the pictures of them walking around places like Regent's Park and people who had them, had them on a lead, Pumas on the lead in you know, in Hyde Park and places like that in London. Um, and it's not that long ago, the early 80s, is it? So it's if they're released, so we, we do know the cats exist. We clearly know they were previously been in this country. Are you telling me they're going to they're gonna breed or not going to breed? And we're not talking about 700 years ago. We're talking about sort of 30 years ago. You could buy them in Harrods. It's very, very feasible. There's a case. There's a good case for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's look at the putt marks. You know, let's look at the paw prints on the floor. Um, if it's a cat, it's got three lobes. If it's a dog, it'll have two. Yeah. So the bottom. Yeah. Jonathan McGowan's got some good ones of those. Yeah, absolutely. Jonathan has. Yeah. And look at the work he's put in over the years. If you've got these casts and it's the size of your hand and it's got the three lobes, what are you saying it is? Yeah, yeah. It is evidence. And all the different types of evidence help each other. It's, it's nice to look for different signs. Matt, I think we're running out of time. Been lovely talking to you. And thank you very much for allowing us to have those photos on the website. I know that you'll be on Matt Everett's forthcoming documentary. People can see this again with you talking to camera with Matt uh, on that. So look forward to that. Well, yeah, you actually see in that documentary, you see the woods exactly where that the scene where those photographs were taken. And actually, you actually see me pacing across the 12 paces between the first example and the second example. You actually see that on the footage. So that's a really good documentary. And I think he's done a really good job on it. Yeah, it's really good, despite the fact that you and I are in it. (laughs) (laughs) That's really good, yeah. The best bit is when I'm just at the beginning with me. No, it's a great subject. I'm enjoying talking about it. And um, long may it continue. All the best, Matt. Thanks ever so much for coming on. Take care. Thank you.
In our interval, before we get to Word of the Week, just to confirm that this is very much an accompanying episode to the documentary Britain's Big Cat Mystery. The five-minute trailer for that one has just been released and it's getting lots of interest. If you've not seen it yet, we've linked it on our website under episode 35 on the References and Links page. And courtesy of the documentary, we have a special and fun finale for you involving the Beast of Bodmin at the end of the show. As we've been saying just there with Matt, the key burst of three photos on his trail camera are available for you to view on the Big Cat Conversations website, so you can see the crucial third picture in that, and it's also been zoomed in and brightened. Matt got those pictures in 2015, and the previous photo he got 18 days before is shown on the documentary. So we're not showing that particular photo, it's reserved for the documentary. And you can see the scaling, and you can hear some people's reactions to it on the documentary. So a big thanks to Matt for making photos available for our website for this episode. So, on to our word of the week, and it is PARDUS. P-A-R-D-U-S, and of course it relates to the Latin classification term and word for leopard, which is Panthera pardus. Pardus is Latin for panther and for leopard, and the word pard also means leopard, and if you want to get really picky about it, pard actually means a male leopard. Within the word pardus, leopard and panther is interchangeable. And it's worth noting that in the Malay Peninsula, which is the main official stronghold of a core black leopard population, local people refer to those black cats as panthers. So panther is quite an acceptable term to use, and especially given that we can't yet demonstrate that most of our large black cat sightings are the leopards many of us suspect. So using a more general but still relevant word, panther, is a valid thing to do, so we should very much embrace the word panther as something to use alongside the word leopard. So there we are, there's pardus as our word of the week, and we'll come back to the words pard and pardus no doubt in the future. Now for our final ten minutes, we have Matt Jones back again, because right on cue, and as we were editing this episode, he called to say he had a fresh sighting when driving in Devon in early October 2020, so now we can hear all about it. We now have a bonus recording with Matt, in addition to the main recording, which we did several weeks before this. We're going to hear about an incident that happened earlier this week, in early October, because Matt now has had a sighting, contrary to what he said earlier in the conversation. He's now seen one from himself, he thinks we're going to hear all about it. Matt, thanks for coming back, and tell us all about what happened earlier in the week. Yeah, it was a shot, really. I was with my son. He's just turned professional as a golfer, and we were off to a golf event. We slowed down in unexpected traffic, crawling along in first gear on the A38 near Chudley in Devon, which is quite a well-known area for big cat sightings over the years. I've had lots of people tell me about sightings there. We were just sort of chatting, and we both looked to the left. We just both went big cat at the same time, and um, that was our instant reaction. There was a black animal to our left sticking very close to the bush line, I'd say between 80 and 120 yards away in the field. It wasn't running around like what a dog would do. There was no owner. And within seconds, I said to him, get your camera, start taking pictures instantly. He did. And he got a couple of good shots, in my opinion, of what the animal looked like. So, yeah, nice surprise sighting. How lucky that you were driving and you had somebody there to get a camera ready and get a couple of shots off. And it's the latest iPhone, iPhone 11 or whatever it is. It's got the better camera, which is a a bonus. Yes. Did he zoom in, Matt? Did he zoom in or decide not to? It took three or four pictures. It was just a a straightforward photograph to start with. And then we zoomed in and and sort of did screenshots afterwards. I could see it clearly. It wasn't sort of, you know, what's that over there? Could it be a cat? It was, I could clearly see it. It was for several seconds as well, because obviously it wasn't a quick glance to my left doing 60. We were literally first gear stop, first gear stop. You know, I could look around and I had a good view. I could see it. I could see its movements. It was very feline in its movements. It was staying very low. Not so much stalking position, but it was just staying quite low. And as I say, it wasn't running around like a, a dog would be running around for its morning walk. It was sticking close to the, the bush line. And there was no owner. I had a good look around. I looked everywhere I could look. And there was no owner. So I don't think it was a dog. 
my best guess would be about a Labrador size. I grew up with a Labrador. I had a Labrador for 15 years. So I kind of know what a Labrador looks like from 80, 100 yards away. And I've now got a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. It's only a year old. I previously had other Staffordshire Bull Terrier for 15 years. So I know what's a Labrador size and what's a Bull Terrier size and what's a small cat and, you know, etc. So to me, it was Labrador size, but very, very feline in its movement. I think the picture sort of kind of showed that. I don't think it looks like a dog. If it was, I, w- I wouldn't have sent it to you. And although we said earlier on we've got proof that Labradors well away from any settlements don't always wear collars, this animal isn't wearing a collar. You can certainly see that when you zoom in. Yeah, I don't think there's a collar at all on it, no, in my opinion. And no owner walking it, and there's no sort of morning dog walker. Your son is interested, but not as into it as you are. And how did he see it? Yeah, he's straight away, big cat. That's a big cat. He says, a cat, it's a cat. He's going, it's a cat. And he's an intelligent lad. As I say, he's a golfer, and he's got good eyesight. Um, obviously a lot much better than mine <laughs> um, at my age. And um, yeah, his opinion was it was a cat. At that distance, Matt, it would have been very small and difficult to see if it was a normal sized domestic cat. Yeah, difficult to see if it was just a domestic cat. It was a large animal. I trained myself to when you see one, if, if you see one, it's camera out, you know, and then start doing the studying. All the stories I've heard over the years of people, oh, I just, I was so shocked I never got my camera out, you know, or whatever. So once my son was taking pictures, I was studying the animal as much as I could. One of the things I noticed was that the tail would go from being straight to then about halfway along, the rear half of it would then bend up at like a 90 degree angle towards the sky. And then, you know, a second or two later, it goes straight again. It was weird how it was, the tail would kept flicking up in the air. And I've never seen a dog do that. As it moved along, it, sort of, it was almost like sniffing bushes. And then it would go up, then it would bend halfway. And then it kind of would go down again. And I saw it go up at least twice. What was the length of the tail compared to the body, do you think? I would say probably in relation to the body, if the body was three or four foot long, and then I'd say the tail was at least three or four you know, foot long. It was, it was a similar size. It was obviously reasonably long for me to see that half of it was bent up. So if you, if you bend that back down again, obviously it's a reasonable length. So it was quite a good sign. It was a, a nice surprise. And I might be wrong. You know, it, it might be a... The, the wild Labrador of Chudley, you know, we don't know, but who knows? Um, and it doesn't bother me one way or the other. You know, I'm not in this to prove anything, really. I, I'm just reporting my sighting, and that's what I saw. And we we were lucky enough, it was a decent enough camera to get reasonable pictures. And in my opinion, it's a cat. Yeah. How long did you see it for together, do you think? Several seconds. So probably, I'd say at least seven, eight, nine, ten seconds, something like that. And then when you actually go one, two, you know, that's quite a long time. Yes. Um, so I was looking at it, you know, I was, so Usain Bolt can run 100 metres. <laughs> I had a good look at it. And then it kind of moved off and we were all crept forward and got behind a bush and, it, and when I looked round, it had gone and it had obviously gone off into the woods. It wasn't a glancing look. I had a, a decent look at it, yeah. Yeah, well done. How long do you think it took your son to get the camera out and ready and clicking? Seconds. You know, these kids, are, they're so quick on their phones. His phone was on his lap anyway. Oh, okay, that helps. Yeah, and he just literally flicked his finger up and it was on camera and he was away. It was seconds, probably two seconds. It's not like it's in a bag and you're flapping around, you can't get it out and then it's gone. You know, it, it's there, it was ready. It took about four and all, I think, and there was two that you can't really see. It had gone behind, it was too low, you couldn't see anything. The two that I sent you were, were the two that were good. And time of day, Matt? Half eight, nine in the morning, it was that sort of time. We was gridlocked on the A38, it was a lot of traffic around. Well, just as well you were gridlocked. <laughs> well, yeah, if it wasn't, we slowed right down, right at the point where we looked left and saw the animal. Obviously, it's exciting and great to have it fresh and relayed for the podcast. That's terrific. But is it also frustrating that you can't really easily find out how to get access to that land and the landowner because it was something you just travelled past and it's going to be very difficult, really, to go back and scale it, which I know you would want to do? I'm going to be trying to do that. The, the problem we've got is stopping in that area. To reshoot it? Yeah, it might be possible to scale. I might have to stand on the inside lane of the A38 to take the pitch <laughs> <laughs> to scale. But, but the risk will be worth it for all of us, Matt. The risk will be worth it, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'll take one for the team, as they say. Yeah, and hopefully your son enjoyed it. I mean, it must have been a great experience for him and to get the photos. Well done. I think he was in golf mode at the time, but he was very sharp with a camera. He was very sharp. Do you reckon it was a black leopard? Yeah, I would say so. It's hard to say it's something else. The movement of it, the fact that there's no collar, there was no owner. It wasn't running around everywhere like a dog would on its morning walk. You add all those factors together and the pictures, I would say I'm 98% certain it was a cat now. My opinion was it, I think it was a black leopard. Yeah. 
Great. Well, you've had your quota for 10 or 20 years now, I think, with that. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to actually see what I believe was a cat and get pictures. Lots of people ring up, oh, I saw a cat, it ran across in front of me and there's no dash cam footage or I didn't get my phone out in time or whatever it might be. But to see one and, as you say, I have my son with me that could get the picture with a modern phone it was quite a result. I was just saying with some of my contacts just before this that with several days of very heavy showery rain that when you get a nice mm-hmm. clear morning after that that's the time when you get sightings and maybe this was one of those it had been torrential weather over the weekend i mean on the sunday it was absolutely horrendous i think it was storm alex i think it was called came through and just absolutely bombarded the area the photo show it's quite bright wasn't it quite a fresh morning and yeah that could be exactly one of those examples well well done matt that's all splendid to hear and finishes off the episode very nicely. I'm more than happy for you to use those photos. You want to put the photos up on your website or use them Lovely. as part of this podcast so you can see what we're talking about. Yeah, great. And as we know, everybody's getting very excited about Matt Everett's documentary, the Britain's Big Cat Mystery, which is going to be out in the new year. It's just about to go to the Sundance Festival to see how it does there. And, of course, that's got one of your photos that we talked about earlier on in the podcast. So we're not we're keeping that one back for Matt's documentary. But the accompanying ones that were around the corner, we are showing. So I'm more than happy for people to say, all right, it's definitely a dog. And, you know, that's fine. I haven't got any issue with that at all. And that is what we're entitled to, right? Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Sure. It makes no difference to me whatsoever. But, you know, I'm looking forward to the documentary as well. I think it'll be great. I think you'll find there's lots of evidence and lots of stories within that from people that actually know what they're talking about. I think it'll be good. I think it'll be a good watch. Yes. It will take the subject forward, which is so nice. It will you know, really add value to what we're all trying to do. And I've got some unchecked rail cams for about three months on the wall. So. Fingers crossed. I shall go and do those. You might be able to finish that documentary off quite nicely. Well, I'm sure we'll speak to you again, Matt, but very good to check in with you. And thanks again for coming on Big Cat Conversations. Always a pleasure. Thanks for your time, Rick. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care, Matt. Thanks. Before we close, just to say that it's been a busy two weeks following our last episode, with several reports coming in. We've had Steve make contact, who was visiting Anglesey, and he reports shock and amazement at seeing a black panther just four miles from where Josh, our guest in episode 30, had his encounter on Anglesey. They have been swapping notes together about those incidents, and I think they've both found it helpful to do so. Steve, incidentally, is a fisherman, and we've asked him, along with other fishing contacts, to spread the word because we'd really like to have a future episode hearing from a couple of witnesses as they've been fishing if they've seen a big cat. Now on to Wendy. She was one of our guests from Lincolnshire in episode 13, and she's got in touch to say she's now met two people close by who have had sightings of a big black panther or leopard-like cat. And one of those witnesses assumed it was fairly common knowledge in the locality because he'd had several viewings in past years. So Wendy has now met some local witnesses in her area, in contrast to her surprise and frustration at not finding any when we spoke to her in episode 13. Also recently, we've been made aware of two reports from Shropshire, one of which was a previous podcast guest, and his sighting was a puma, and we've heard of a black leopard-like report in Dorset, and for that one, rosettes were described, so the witness did readily assume it was a leopard. And close to Matt's sighting we've just heard about in Devon, we've also had a similar size large black cat reported in an area which seems to be around eight miles south of Matt's one within the same week. So the network is working and Matt certainly found that one useful to know about. And we're still going because following our last episode on the misfits and black servals, we've had two further black serval reports across the country and a similar one again in Shropshire, but that's thought to be a possible black savannah cat. And as we know, savannas are certainly trending at present and they do, of course, link to the serval, so will look similar. And amongst all of that, perhaps the standout report we've had since last time is from Nicola, and this is another potential black serval in East Sussex, where Joel was, and I'm going to read a part of Nicola's email here. Joel's description of a big black cat with large pointed ears near Hastings is of special interest because my gran had an up-close encounter with a large jet black cat in Scrubland at Pevensey Bay, 12 miles from Hastings. 
What has always confused our family is that she described it as having big pointed ears, and we wondered if it was a weird black lynx type cat. What is more startling to me is that this sighting was in 1983, but sounds very much like what Joel saw. It does throw up the question of a breeding population of serval like cats. I thought that you and Joel may like to hear about this, as it does suggest that these type of pointed-eared large black cats have been around the Hastings areas for nearly 40 years. Thanks for that one, Nicola, and Joel was also intrigued to hear of it. So it's all happening, and thanks to everyone for relaying those reports, and of course it's nice to see the connections in some of these reports, and to help join people up in nearby locations. Last episode, we promised you forthcoming shows on Lynx and on some interesting reports from Wiltshire, Berkshire and Gloucestershire. Well, it's Lynx next time, with two different witness reports and a conversation with David Hetherington about the Eurasian Lynx and how communities in Europe coexist with the Lynx. David Hetherington is the author of the splendid recent book, The Lynx and Us. As we close this episode, we are not playing out with our usual music because we have something very rustic for you. Brace yourselves for the talented West Country band The Surfin' Turnips. What you're about to hear is music for the closing credits of the documentary Britain's Big Cat Mystery. We've got special permission to use it here on the podcast. If you want to hear more from The Surfin' Turnips, you can find them on the web, on Facebook or on music lists like Spotify. The particular track coming up is a remix for the documentary, but it is originally from their album, Back on the Lash. Nearly finished now, but we must say a big thanks to Matt Jones for being our guest and for the bonus of his photos on the website. Thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you can join us next time. Get in touch if you'd like to, and please take care. Finally, the mist is rising on the moors because here, courtesy of Surfing Turnips, is the Beast of Bodmin. I remix him with the double D. Now I've seen him in tragedy. Cause I know I can't get away. I started with a trepidation. Now he's did him in annihilation. Cause I know I can't get away. I hear the call of the beast. The beast of Bodmin. I know I can't get away. They were lamentating me. And me folks have gone away. The beast of bombings out to play. There's one thing you gotta be told this land be ancient, land be cruel, and I know I can't get away. When the mist is sent on the hill, they hide many forgotten hills, and I know I can't get away. I hear the call of the beast, the beast of bombing. I know I can't. Lamentating me and me folks had gone away And now the beast of Bodmin's out to play Gone away, and now the beast of bondage has to play. play.